I now call to order the Society's 2,474th meeting in what is now the 152nd year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everybody. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. So welcome to our members, guests, and friends. The Society is grateful to the sponsors of the full year, Mike Helton and Helton Associates. Thank you, Mike. He's in the audience somewhere. And uh, Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University. We are also grateful to the sponsor of the spring lecture series this year, BSW member Tim Thomas. Thank you, Tim. Tim is in the front row here. And we are grateful to the sponsors of tonight's lecture, PSW, PSW member Erica Kane and Bruce Kane, who are right here in the audience. Thank you, Erica and Bruce. of sponsors, as mentioned at the last meeting and the one before that and the one before that and the one before that, we're under, we're having a fundraising campaign so that we'll be able to meet our expenses in the coming year without having to reduce the number of meetings and lectures and without having to spend down reserves. This is occasioned by the fact that the Cosmos Club has quadrupled the amount of money they charge us for using these facilities. So we're trying to raise $25,000 more in dues, contributions, and sponsorships than were raised in previous years. And while we have gotten close to that goal, we are still a little bit short, and we would welcome any contributions that any of you can make. If you are so inclined and have the wherewithal, uh, please tell me or write to our corresponding secretary, corresponding sec at pswscience.org. I am pleased to announce the following new member, tonight's speaker, Walter Harris, who learned a PSW from the invitation to speak here tonight, and whose interest will be clear in some part from tonight's lecture. We welcome him to membership. If you're not a member and you would like to join PSW or support the society, you can do so through the PSW website using the blue join button on the upper right-hand corner of the homepage. We welcome new members and we appreciate donations. All new members are entitled to wear the PSW Science rosette. The rosettes are $15 plus 90 cents DC sales tax. They can be purchased online or at the rosette table in the back. Please note that rosettes must be picked up at a lecture at the Cosmos Club so that we don't have to keep track of the sales tax and all the places that we would mail the rosettes to. Cameo Lance will now read the minutes via a recording made earlier of the 2473rd meeting and the lecture by Andrea Ramirez on NIH's All of Us Research Project. On March 3rd, 2023, from the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., and by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called together the 2473rd meeting of the Society to Order at 8.05 p.m. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Andrea Ramirez, Chief Data Officer at the National Institutes of Health. Her lecture was titled, The All of Us Research Program. Ramirez began by highlighting the importance of observation in medicine and highlighted the founding principles of observational cohort studies, particularly the Framington Heart Study, which was instrumental in understanding the impact of blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking on heart disease. The speaker emphasized the need for a personalized approach to medicine and the challenges of understanding the genome and drug response. 
Ramirez discussed the complexity of implementing genomic medicine in clinical practice, using diabetes as an example. She highlighted the need for more observation and learning to better understand the implications of genomics in diverse populations. The speaker compared the precision of astrophysics in studying outer space to the need for doctors to observe and learn more about their patients with diabetes. The speaker then went on to review the All of Us Research Program, which is a longitudinal study aiming to enroll one million or more participants to capture broad range of common and rare diseases. Ramirez emphasized the core values of the program, including openness, diversity, transparency, and engagement with the participants. The program collects a variety of data, including biospecimens, electronic health records, surveys, and mobile device data. The speaker emphasized the importance of returning value to participants through access to their information and prioritizing engagement. The program partners with a variety of healthcare organizations to ensure inclusivity and diversity in, in recruitment. Ramirez then announced the upcoming release of a large set of whole genome sequences using a new technology that can identify structural variants. The program is also expanding to include ancillary studies to allow researchers to recontact participants and ask more specific questions. The program hopes to continue to grow and engage more participants to help researchers answer deeper questions in medical research. The, lecture, er, the lecturer, Ramirez, discussed the All of Us Research Program's five-year goal structure and their approach to conducting demonstration projects. The five-year goals include scaling enrollment and retention, getting data available to researchers, launching ancillary studies, and supporting a diverse global community of researchers. The demonstration projects aim to characterize and validate the cohort for quality, utility, and diversity of data and tools, not just to make discoveries. By conducting demonstration projects, researchers can understand how to use the data and identify any quality issues or changes in the data set. She then provided an example of two demonstration projects, one on diversity and the other on pediatric data. The program is continuing to conduct demonstration projects on phenotype and genotype data. Next, the question and answer period began. One member asked what demonstration projects specifically are being conducted. The speaker responded that there have been demonstration projects on phenotype and genotype data where they have generated data and then made it available to researchers. Another member asked what hypotheses were being tested and an example case. Ramirez explained that the pediatric obesity had been changing over time and researchers were able to confirm their diagnosis by looking at the spread of data. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 10.06 p.m. The temperature in Washington, D.C. was 7 degrees Celsius. The weather was cloudy with light precipitation. Respectfully submitted, Recording Secretary, Camille Lance. Thank you, Cameo. Are there any comments, corrections on the minutes? Oh, I'll have one. We didn't have a Zoom webinar, so we may have to correct that part. But other than that, hearing none, I will entertain a motion by a member to accept the minutes, and I will entertain a second. All members in favor? All members opposed? The minutes are accepted unanimously and will be posted to the website in due course. And we now turn to tonight's lecture by Walter Harris on comets, centaurs, and trans-Neptunian objects, exploring the echoes of formation in the outer solar system. Walt is professor of planetary science at the University of Arizona. 
chief scientist of the Arizona Space Institute and deputy director for community engagement at the Space Force Center. Walt's research is focused on the structure of thin atmospheres and their transition to and interactions with the space environment. He has been particularly interested in in the formation, information that common atmospheres provide about basic photochemical processes, the formation of the solar system, and the characteristics of the solar wind. He is also engaged in an ongoing study of the plasma interface between the solar wind and interstellar medium via remote sensing of interstellar neutral material as it passes through the solar system. Walt earned a BS in astronomy and a BSE in engineering physics at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and a PhD in astronomy and astro-atmospheric and space science at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during the Q&A session. Walt, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Really excited to be here tonight to uh, talk about comets, centaurs, and trans-Neptunian objects. Um, I'm going to issue a spoiler right at the beginning of this. Uh, it was suggested initially that I call it comets, and I thought that wasn't dramatic enough. So I called it comets, centaurs, and trans-Neptunian objects, despite the fact that all of them are the very same thing. Uh, but they are different in fundamental ways at least insofar as we describe them, uh, that tell us something about not only their history, but the history of our solar system. So uh, by way of an outline, so I'm going to first kind of go way back to the beginning of how we make planetary systems, how we now understand planetary systems to form. We, had an idea about it. We had many good ideas in the last 20 to 25 years. We've really solidified these ideas. It's getting much stronger, and it's tying into where these objects are coming from. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into how the late stages of forming our planetary systems, of which comets played a major role, uh, uh, involved the movement of planets and subsequently the movement of comets into the modern places where we find them uh, in stable orbits. And then I'm going to talk about comets as most of us think about them. We think about comets as these bright, fuzzy objects in the sky with tails that are out and they make it in the news and they're very pretty. And there's a reason why comets have a long, long history with mankind. I mean, there are drawings of comets on cave walls. Comets have been blamed for everything from plagues to invasions to whatever, because they are bright, they are in the sky, and nobody could predict them until very recently. So uh, all of that is due to comet activity. And that activity is actually where we are learning about what those comets are made of. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about the part of comets that we never saw until only about 30, 40 years ago. And that's the nuclei. And the nucleus is really the comet. Uh, it's very different from the big ball of gas with tails and everything else. It's actually very, very small, ridiculously dark, and, uh, and kind of ephemeral, sort of a cosmic dust bunny. Uh, and then we we'll talk about the things that we still don't know about them. Uh, because there are a lot of things that are open questions with comets. And a lot of that has to do with the limitations of the objects that we are able to observe easily. And that leads to the last part, which is where I talk about the centaurs, which are a class of object that are accessible to us, but move us a little bit further back in time so that we can look at objects that are a little more close to the beginning of the solar system than the modern solar system today. So when I said going back to the beginning, I really mean it. Uh, and I have a reason for why I'm moving in this direction. Uh, star forming regions in galaxies are generally associated 
with regions of high density, dust, and molecular compounds. And those molecular compounds can include things like carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane, water, and they are high density regions. We could see hints of those in visible images of galaxies like uh, M74 on the left side of your screen, or it's the right side of your screen from my perspective. Uh, but uh, after James Webb was launched, I still remember a colleague of mine uh, wrote a uh, little missive on Twitter where he started with, he goes, um, well, hum de hum, I wonder what JWST saw today, oh my god. And it was M74 in the infrared with the James Webb Space Telescope. And it, it looks like a kind of eldritch horror of nests of material and debris. And it's actually regions of high density where there's dust, where there's gas, where there's ice. And it's in those regions. And if you look closely at it, you can see red dots inside it. Those are stars. And we already knew that's what we were going to find when we looked at this galaxy, because we've seen the same thing in our galaxy. Next to that, you can see uh, a very famous Hubble image called the Pillars of Creation. And inside those pillars, you see these red dots that I've put arrows next to, in case you didn't notice them. And those are protostars forming inside those. And below, not necessarily all from that particular nebula, but is a sample of what you normally see. You see a circular region around it. And the farthest one to the left, you'll notice, is a disk. And that is where a star is forming. And that is also where comets are forming. Now, the basic model for how you form a star has to do with really, really basic physics. I have a reason for going all the way back to really basic physics that I'll come back to, but space in these areas like these nebulas and everything else are stable, and they are stable because there is an innate pressure inside the gas and the dust that is pushing against the gravitational attraction of that material that's trying to collapse it down. If it tries to collapse down a little bit, it heats up some, and that pushes back against it, and it's stable. And it stays that way maybe for billions of years. In the case of some of these regions, it's been several billion years because our galaxy is quite old. But occasionally something happens. A supernova goes off, a star comes by, something occurs that upsets that balance. And what happens is that material begins to collapse inward. Gravity overcomes pressure and down it goes into a much smaller area. The initial area can be light years across, several light years across. Um, and the process that they are, I'm talking about here is something called genes collapse for the person who initially proposed this idea. And it's more complicated than it sounds because, of course, when I'm talking about pressure in this room, I'm talking about instantaneous pressure. And when you're talking about pressure over light years, you're talking about a response time that is quite a bit longer. So it's, it's not quite as simple as it sounds, but basically it works out that way if you give it enough time. And so that material starts to collapse downward. And molecular clouds are not uniform. They're denser in some regions than others. And so what typically happens is once the collapse starts, you get a collapse here, collapse here, collapse here, collapse here, collapse here, collapse here, collapse here. And suddenly, instead of forming down to just one star, you form a bunch of stars. Maybe one large one, a blue giant, that lives 20, 30 million years and then explodes and dissipates the rest of the cloud. Most of the stars you make will be red dwarfs, make a couple stars like our sun. Um, but basically what happens is you have a density perturbation, inside that perturbation you have sub-perturbations and those collapse down to make objects. Now, there was a very famous star near us, Beta Pictoris, that we could see a disk forming around it. And for many, many years early in my career, that was the only protoplanetary disk any of us had seen. And it was very nice because we could see it edge on. It was very impressive. And it was, it was huge. Beta Pictoris is a, a star. It's much brighter than our sun, much more massive. Uh, but about a decade ago, 
uh, a, a, a telescope array that I, many people have not even heard of called ALMA, started taking these images in radio, sub-millimeter radio frequencies, and they began to take these just drop-dead, gorgeous pictures of actual forming planetary systems. These are not simulations. These are images taken with ALMA. And you can see systems with big gaps in them. You can imagine what is inside those gaps. You can see images with turbulent structure inside them. Uh, and if you were remembering the picture I showed you just a couple of minutes ago, it looks kind of like a galaxy with density waves inside it. Uh, others maybe have no structure at all. They're just, um, they're just a, a rotating disk. And the reason why we see these disks at all is because everything rotates in our galaxy. Our galaxy rotates every 200 million years, which means that if you are in a, uh, in a high density region inside that galaxy, you are rotating every 200 million years. So there is some rotation. And if you go from something that is rotating every 200 million years that is five light years across, and you collapse that down to something that is a light hour across, you will massively increase the angular momentum of that rotation. And so just like a figure skater that sticks their arms out and then pulls them in and starts spinning faster, that happens with a forming star system. And when that happens, it flattens out into a disk. And every star system that we see is a different projection of one of those disks into our field of view. It can be like Beta Pictoris is flat on, and some of the ones that we've seen with Alma are that way, or we can get lucky and see it face on, but we know it's a disk. We know it's rotating. And we know that it's rotating because that rotation is in us today. The Earth is moving around the sun. That is the residual rotation of the disk in which the planets formed. The sun is rotating. That is a legacy of the rotation of that disk. So we know disks form with instabilities in them. Our modern theory for how this happens is that a disk is an actually fairly complex structure. Because in addition to the fact that you have this rotating dense region around a protostar, which is rapidly accumulating gas, you have gas from the collapsing region that's just falling down on every part of this disk. And so you have hot regions at the outside, less hot regions as you go in, and then the heavier, denser, colder material falling down into something that we call the midplane. And the midplane is generally dark. It's so dense that sunlight can't penetrate it. Not that there's a sun at this point, but there is a hot object that is emitting light. As you are moving closer to that protostar, that material is increasingly composed entirely of dust and heavy molecular compounds on those dust. And that is the material that is going to form asteroids. And asteroids are not free of water and other gases, but they are diminished quite considerably compared with the outer solar system. Once you get beyond a thing that we call the snow line, which is a great name, but it's not perfect because it only really starts it. At a certain point, it is cold enough in that midplane that ice can actually start to condense. And an essential component of how you make a planetary system is it condenses on interstellar dust. These are silicate, silicate filamentary grains that are in all of these clouds. And if we don't have it, we don't really understand how to form planets. That doesn't mean that we don't form planets because we've seen planets around stars that we don't think should have had any dust. So there's that. But our working understanding is that you either have dust that's um, aggregating together or you have dust onto which water ice and then as you get farther out, more and more volatile materials that began to condense out on it. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, other ices. And in addition to 
the um, ice is forming themselves, within that, we are trapping other gases in a, like a clathrate matrix. And one of the big questions as cometary scientists that we want to answer is, which is it? When we see something in a comet, is it something that condensed out as an ice? Or is it something that got trapped into it? It just happened to be there as the crystal formed. It's kind of like bubbles in ice with air. Uh, so that process is happening. And as we get farther and further away, the composition is changing. Now, water is probably the dominant volatile species inside here, but carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide are also there. And then you have a number of other compounds that are way down in terms of their density. And at the same time, we think that these forming fragmentary bodies that um, are accumulating onto the dust grains are getting stirred up inside the disk. If they move in too far, they evaporate and they become asteroids. But if, as long as they stay out in that area, they remain cold and jacketed with ice, small particles. So now comes the part that we're still working on. Um, it's easy for us to understand how you can get a small 20 micron, 100 micron piece of dust and get it jacketed with some ice and make it maybe a millimeter or so in size. But it becomes very difficult to make it a meter in size or 10 meters in size. And part of the reason for that is everything in here is orbiting this protostar. All that rotation that I was talking about is there. And if you take a millimeter dust grain with some ice on it and you slam it into another millimeter uh, diameter dust grain with some ice on it, one of three things is going to happen. They're either going to obliterate, obliterate each other, they're going to bounce off each other ineffectually, or they stick. And it should not come as any surprise that sticking requires low velocities. Well, if we're mixing inside a disk, if we have turbulence inside that disk, that means that there's some variability in the velocities. And so it is easy to generate enough velocity for us to not have things stick together at all. And so um, I show here a uh, paper where somebody looked at the relative sizes of the two objects that are hitting and their velocity. And notice this number here, you know, 10 centimeters per second. That is nothing in space. That is basically floating together you know, four inches per second. You walk much faster than that. And what they find is, is that it also needs to have a high ratio of mass. So a big object with a small object sticks better than two small objects. We're not fully clear exactly how this works. There are a number of theories for how you put things together, and all of them sound really good. Um, one of them is, is that these things are in very local co-orbital regions. They slowly accumulate in the way that you might roll up a snowball. Um, they're entrained with the gas and the dust, and then they get to a certain size, and then they're fairly large, and they decouple from the gas and the dust, they start drifting inward. And when that happens, they start to accumulate things because they're bigger than everything about, around them, and they start to grow. But they're also drifting toward the sun. So if that process continues, then they're melted and they're gone. Um, another possibility is what we see in these density waves. And this is why I bring up galaxy at the beginning of this. Because a planetary system arguably is going to look very similar to the way a forming galaxy is. And one prominent theory for how we form these objects is that within this spiral density wave, again, higher density, colder regions with molecules, ices, dust grains, and everything else, there is pressure holding them up against gravity locally. And if the gravity locally is large enough, which an instability inside that disk can produce, then you can get a mini version of Jean's collapse inside the disk. 
just the same process that we saw for forming the star system in the first place can form trillions of these small objects, miniature collapses. And you can see in this model here uh, the density going from uniform to a little bit more dense to these clumps. And you can see those clumps are different sizes, just like the stars that I was showing, different sizes. Maybe it's going to collapse down to enough material to make an object a kilometer across or 10 kilometers across. And so within that, you have a free-floating, more or less co-orbital collapse region where all the velocities are low. And inside that, you're forming subparticles that continue to fall in and interact with each other at low velocity. And so you can form a comet nucleus, or an asteroid, to be honest, uh, out of these smaller particles. Now, there are schools of thought within this that says you only form one size of particle, and then you form a body, however it looks, out of those one size of particles, or you form particles of various sizes, and those get together and form a clumpy object with a lot of material or a lot of empty space between them. And so the prediction is that a comet, whether you form it from this process or from this accumulate and stream process is going to be very, very porous, mostly empty space, and not very cohesive. There's not a lot of gravity. It's not got a lot of chemical connectivity. It's not like a rock. Um, and as a result, these objects are expected to be almost strengthless. So if you think about comets in the movies and everything else, they always kind of picture a comet as a, uh, as a single ball of ice. And in fact, the first model for comets uh, where they coined the term uh, dirty ice ball uh, was by Fred Whipple. And he said a comet was a uniformly cohesive solid ball of ice with a little bit of dust in it. And we no longer think that's true, but I give him credit for being the first one to come up with a real model for it. Uh, but the prediction is, is that we should get objects that have very little tensile strength, easy to break apart. Now, these objects continue to accumulate. And once you get above a certain size, and you have objects of differential sizes, as we just showed, you can collide them together, and they'll accumulate into bigger objects. And this is how we form planets. In the outer solar system, comets got together and formed larger and larger objects, protoplanets, things like Pluto uh, that are no longer comets. They're actually planets in their own right. Uh, and then those accumulate and accumulate, and they become bigger objects, and they become the cores of the giant planets. In the case of Jupiter and Saturn, they eventually got so big that they started to just accumulate gas straight out of the disk and became very sun-like in their composition. But Uranus and Neptune appear to be a perfect example of a planet made entirely of comets reflecting their composition, which makes them very interesting to study. NASA recently suggested that we should f send a flagship mission to Uranus. Totally support that. Uh, but it's still going to be complex to look at it. Uh, the remaining objects, after those planets formed, are now noticing inside this disk, there is a planet that is 300 times the mass of Earth, another that is 90 times the mass of Earth, and two that are about 15 to 20 times the mass of Earth. They have big gravitational Im imprints in the outer solar system. And if you're a small little comet, you notice. And as a result, once those planets are there, and until the sun enters the main sequence, and in a flash blows away the remainder of the protoplanetary disk, you're just shedding comets. Most of the comets that did not go into planets were thrown out into interstellar space. The implications of that, pretty darn cool. Wherever you go in our galaxy, there are just comets everywhere. The entire galaxy is filled with comets. By the way, probably also rogue planets that are kicked out by this process. So uh, the space between the stars is very interesting. There are some that are left. And to give you a sense of what this process might look like, this is an exaggeration, but still a model for forming a planetary system. So now imagine you're a comet 
in the system, and you're forming density waves and all sorts of stuff. Then the planets start to form, and you can see the planets here, not our planets, but a reasonable model that you might expect. This is a big scattering game. Now, they're going to accumulate a lot of these objects. They're going to send some into the sun. If there are inner planets, they're going to send them in to collide with the inner planets. Uh, but a lot is just going to get thrown out of the solar system altogether or left in an area the planets didn't affect or thrown a long way away. So there are a lot of models for how that proceeded in our solar system. There are two things that affected planets. Uh, the first is interactions among themselves. So there's a lot of evidence that Jupiter and Saturn probably had a gravitational resonance with each other early in the history of the solar system, and that caused them to migrate around. Now, how much and where? That is a function of a lot of assumptions that we have to make and we don't have the answer to. So um, there are a number of models. A famous one is called the Nice model. Another one is called the Grand Tack. That's the one that I included here. And to just give you a sense of what that looks like, In this particular case, Jupiter and Saturn migrate in and then migrate out to where they are. And all of those red and blue dots, they're asteroids and comets. And you can see it's a wrecking ball. All of this debris is getting thrown up. And you can see two things are happening to them. That they're getting scattered off the disk and they're being thrown out of the solar system altogether. Um, another uh, actually model that predates all of this is from 1984 uh, by Fernandez and Ip. It was not widely publicized at the time, but they said, you know what? Actually, comets themselves, just by themselves, can make this happen. And they said, if you're Jupiter and you have all these comets and these comets are coming in and they are coming from orbits that are farther away, well, every time you scatter one of those out, even though it's a trivial amount of mass, they are transferring their angular momentum to Jupiter and to Saturn and to Uranus and to Neptune. And the net result of that is if you scatter enough of these objects away, they all begin to migrate outward. And it's not as dramatic as the Grand Tack, but it is a very real phenomenon. And it's very important for our understanding of what happened with Neptune. Now, about a decade after this was uh, advanced, um, a colleague of mine at the University of Arizona, uh, Renu Mahatra, uh, proposed that she could predict, using models, that Neptune's migration pushed Pluto and a whole bunch of other objects out to their current orbits and established a series of resonances that were orbitally stable for small bodies farther away. And subsequent to that, we have realized that this is almost certainly true. So we have more evidence for this late stage comet driven migration of the planets than we have for the Grand Tack, but it's pretty clear that both of these happened and that it did a great job of clearing the decks. Inside the orbit of Neptune, there are no stable orbits for comets that just don't exist. So that process gave us the reservoirs of objects that we see today. So when we see a comet, this is what you all think of. Uh, you guys have all probably seen this comet in the news. I, I deliberately borrowed it. It's, uh, it's comet ZTF, the rare green comet. Who has seen that in the news? Yeah, everybody saw it. Comet scientists hate that rare green comet thing, and I'll get to why. But, um, but nevertheless, it's great. Comets get in the news all the time. Who knows why? It's a beautiful comet. It's very nice. This is what we all think of when we see a comet. And there are three big things that we see in a comet. We see two tails. Uh, we see an, uh, an ion tail, which in this particular case is just going off in one direction. That is moving directly away from the sun. It is gases that have come off the comet that solar ultraviolet radiation have ionized. And then they have noticed, oh, solar wind. And they get grabbed by that solar wind and dragged away at high velocity. 
There's also a dust tail. And the dust tail is larger particles of dust that have come off the surface of the comet. They generally move forward and backward of the comet along its orbit. And they create a orbital path of debris around that orbit. We are very familiar with several of these orbital debris because occasionally the Earth passes through that orbit. And that's where we get meteor showers. When we pass through the orbit of one of these comets, we are passing through the legacy dust tail of a comet. But the money for understanding our history, understanding what's going on specifically, and don't get me wrong, you can make a career out of studying either of these. I study the ion tails, very fascinating, different lecture. This is the coma that central circular condensation filled with neutral gas and dust. That is the stuff that is coming off that nucleus. That's what's telling us what's inside there. And so when we say we want to study a comet and understand what it's made of, that's where we go. Now before we go any further, uh, we have to go to orbit school for about a minute, just a minute. So there's two things about a comet uh, that are deterministic for us understanding where it came from and what it's doing and how likely we are to be able to explore it in detail. Uh, the first is the inclination of its orbit. So when I said we formed a disk, right, we did, totally. And that disk today, we call that the ecliptic. All the planets are in the ecliptic. Some objects deviate from the ecliptic by a little bit. There's a little variation among the planets, not much. That's because of all that angular momentum in that disk. It's very hard to change it. Comets can have an inclination that moves well off the disk. This is, I'm showing comet Ison here. Uh, and you can see comet Ison is maybe, you know, 45 degrees off the disk. The second thing that is important is the eccentricity of the orbit. And the eccentricity of the orbit is based on the difference between and the summation of the closest distance the comet gets to the sun and the farthest distance it gets from the sun. The perihelion and the aphelion. And the difference between them divided by the summation of them gives you the eccentricity. An eccentricity of, uh, of zero is a circular orbit. An eccentricity of one is a parabolic orbit. In other words, it closes at infinity. We can't tell the difference between it coming from the other side of the universe and coming from 10,000 times as far away from the sun as the Earth. And another distance, another unit that I'll put in here is something called an astronomical unit, because distances are starting to get really big here. Uh, I'm just going to throw that out. So when I use that term, astronomical unit, or AU, what I am saying is, is that is in units of the average radius of the Earth's orbit, 150 million kilometers, give or take. So if something is at 10 AU, like Saturn, it's 10 times as far away from the sun as Earth. If we take a whole bunch of comets, as many as you want, um, and you start to plot them, things start to come out very quickly. And so what I've done here is I plotted on one side, uh, I plotted the orbital inclination relative to the eccentricity. Now keep in mind, the higher the eccentricity, basically the farther away from the sun its aphelion is. The lower the inclination, the closer it is to the plane of the planets. Now, if you know something about angles, you know that 0 to 90 means something. What does 90 to 180 mean in terms of inclination for comets? What it means in that case is, whereas everything in the solar system rotates around the sun in the same direction, that legacy of angular momentum, objects with an inclination greater than 90 are retrograde. They're going the other way around the sun. Now, it's pretty clear from looking at these two plots. The other plot is uh, the aphelion distance, which is done in log form. So these are grades of 10. 
And what you can see is, is the things with very, very large separations from the sun are isotropic. They have no particular inclination at all. They could be retrograde, prograde, zero degrees, 90 degrees. It's a sphere. Everything in close to the sun with reasonable small orbits, 20 to 100 years or so, most of them are close to the ecliptic. Some scatter, but they're prograde, and they hang in the orbital path of the planets. There's a transition where there's a bunch of things that are more isotropic, but not really super far away. Their, their orbits might close still within the solar system. And we call those objects Halley-type comets, because, of course, the first comet we identify as orbiting around the sun is a weird one. Uh, Halley has a retrograde orbit at very high inclination. Uh, but for the most part, objects with a spherical incoming distribution, they could come from anywhere, they could be going one direction or the other, have very long periods, very far away. You'll look at that plot on, um, uh, that has the uh, perihelion distance, or actually in that case, semi-major axis, but it has the distance away from the sun, you're getting up to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 times uh, the distance from the Earth to the sun. For reference, that's light years. So we are getting comets that are coming from ridiculously far away almost halfway to the nearest star. In some cases, even further than that. Now, um, there are classifications that we give them. So these ecliptic comets that are low inclination, relatively low uh, orbital periods, 20 years or less, um, they're short period comets or the most important of them is a group that we call the Jupiter family. And we call them the Jupiter family because their orbits are phased with Jupiter, which is telling you why they're in the inner solar system. Jupiter is the big dog of the solar system. It's 300 times the mass of Earth. It's two and a half times the mass of Saturn. Anything that happens in the solar system is going to happen because of Jupiter because before it's going to happen because of anything else. Saturn plays a role, sure. We like to tell it it's important. But Jupiter, Jupiter is the big thing. One might argue Saturn was insecure, so it had to get a ring. Uh, <laughs> we're happy for that. Uh, but really, it's about Jupiter. So we call these the Jupiter family, and we, we can trace them. We can do the, take the orbits back in time for most of these objects, and eventually, oh yeah, they had an encounter with Jupiter. Very important. Uh, the other group that we have are the long period comets, more than 200 years. And one of the characteristics that I can tell you about something that has a period of more than 200 years is maybe one or two of them we have seen more than once. Because if something has a period of 500 years, well, the first comet ever identified to orbit around the sun is only about 300 years ago. So no, <laughs> we haven't seen it come back again. So we see those once. Sure, Jupiter family comets, five, six, ten years. We see them over and over again. I like Jupiter family comets. I can predict where they're going to be. I know when they're going to show up. We've seen them before. We know how bright they're going to be. It's always great. Long period comets, they come in. Uh, some of you might be old enough to remember Kahootek. Does anybody remember Kahootek? Uh, it's mid-70s, and Kahootek was coming in as a long-period comet. We don't normally identify comets when they're really far from the sun, so when we saw this one, we went, oh, it's going to be a monster. It's going to be the most amazing comet ever. It was all over the news. Everything happened. It didn't brighten, and uh, we just kind of walked away as a community with our tail between our legs. And turns out that's actually a very interesting property of long-period comets that we see with some frequency. We don't understand it. Uh, but we'd surely like to because we don't like being embarrassed. So the long period comets are in something probably most of you have heard of called the Oort cloud. And this was predicted 
way back in the 1940s, 1950s by Jan Oort and his student, uh, whose first name I'm forgetting, but is Opik. Uh, Opik actually did this model. He said Jupiter kicks out a whole bunch of these objects and they get into these very, very distant orbits. And then what happens, they get so far away from the sun, the sun no longer seems to be the most important thing. They're still associated with the sun and they are orbiting the sun, but they actually start to feel the tide of the other stars in our galaxy, which is a weird concept. When I was coming up, I always thought of uh, these objects as having interactions with each other. That's why they came into the inner solar system. It turns out you could have 50 trillion comets in the Oort cloud and they would never encounter each other. They would be hundreds of millions of kilometers apart. They don't encounter each other. People every once in a while talk about, we should have a mission that goes to the Oort cloud. And I always ask them, how are you gonna find one? These things are very dark, very small, and it's not like Star Wars where there's asteroids everywhere and banging into each other. These things are just sitting in the middle of nowhere by themselves. It's these tides. These tides stretch their orbits out or contract their orbits in. And so there's a constant stream of objects getting further and further from the sun and objects coming in. And those are the long period comets. They're coming from this region called the Oort cloud. There's an inner Oort cloud that's maybe three to 5,000 times as far from the sun as the earth, but the tides are much less effective there. So we probably are getting much fewer of them than we are from the outer part of the Oort cloud. Another thing that people used to think is, is, oh, well, what brings them in is a passing star that just goes through the Oort cloud. Turns out that doesn't matter. Uh, people do the models, it's these tides that are pushing these objects in and out. But they have been sitting in the coldest of cold storage for four billion years, out in the middle of nowhere. Now, um, the orbital characteristics of long period comets, uh, we could get that, but it's very hard to explain the Jupiter family comets with this model. Uh, you, can, you can get Jupiter to kick objects out, and Saturn will help. Always have to acknowledge that Saturn helps. And, uh, but getting them to stay in the ecliptic, getting their distributions to be uh, not random, still prograde, still orbiting the sun, more or less like the planets, that's not easy. So in the late 1930s, uh, an astronomer named Edgeworth proposed, well, maybe there's a population of objects beyond Neptune, you know, the outer edge of this cloud of comets. And then about 15 years later, and I work in his building, so I have to acknowledge this, Gerard Kuiper uh, said something similar, but a bit dismissively. And after that, people started talking about the Kuiper belt. Now this is controversial in our field because Kuiper really didn't predict it, Edgeworth did, and Kuiper rubbed some people the wrong way about it, and so uh, that's why I called them trans-Neptunian objects in my title, so that I don't offend anybody, but I will call it the Kuiper-Edgeworth belt uh, because he, they both really predicted it, more or less. And uh, they said, okay, there's gonna be these objects way beyond Neptune, and they'll be out there. And then Malhotra's model suggests that there will be more objects, not the ones that just formed there, but that were pushed out by Neptune as it was moving away from the sun at that last stage of migration. Uh, so in 1992, uh, two astronomers discovered the first Kuiper Edgeworth trans Neptunian object. And uh, I want to acknowledge what a phenomenal feat of astronomy that was, because that was the equivalent of identifying a piece of charcoal an eighth of an inch across in Flagstaff from Tucson, with the only information that you had is that it's probably on the circle <laughs> around there. Now, the fact that they found it tells you a lot. There are gotta be a lot of these objects. And in fact, now we know of several thousand of them. And uh, they are all over in this region out there. We kind of knew they had to be there because this is 
where we were going to get these comets from. So there are three parts to the, uh, to the Kuiper Edgeworth belt. There is what they call the cold classical disk. These are objects that are orbiting where they formed four billion years ago. Never scattered, nothing. They just, they were there. Wasn't enough to make a planet, so they're still there. There is what we call the scattered disk. This is a population of objects that were pushed by Neptune, formed probably only a little bit inside the cold classical disk, nevertheless pushed out. They're scattered. They still interact with Neptune. And we think that scattered disk is where the Jupiter family comes from. And then there's another group, which is the resonant group, which is that group that is in solid, stable resonances established by Neptune during that last migration. Those objects are in stable resonances because they just don't interact positively with Neptune. They don't ever get close. They always kind of avoid each other, Neptune and these objects. All right, so now we've set the stage. We know where these objects come from. We have a group that's way far away, a group that's not so far away. Uh, and in terms of composition, we have these three things. We have the dust tail, the ion tail, already told you that's not really where the money is. So we're going to go straight into the composition, how we identify these objects. Now, we first started understanding that comets were composed of gases that we could identify back in the 19th century. Early spectra uh, identified a molecule, carbon-2, which, by the way, is green. Go green comet. Uh, C2 is prominent in every comet. We always see it. So when somebody says, ooh, it's a green comet, we all go, ooh, it's a comet. Uh, then, subsequently, we discovered that they had a molecule called cyanogen, CN. Now, that molecule usually starts out with a hydrogen attached to it, and we call it cyanide. So this discovery uh, provoked a bit of a freak out collectively among people when in 1910, we saw cyanogen in the coma of Comet Halley and then we pass through the tail of Comet Halley, and people are like, oh, we're all going to die. It's not the first time and not the last time people said, this comet is going to kill us. And people come up with all these ideas, like rent a submarine and stay in there for three months, uh, go to China, because that's going to be on the other side of the planet when we pass through it, and buy my comet pills, <laughs> which people sold. And of course, like I said, it hasn't stopped, so I included the headline of rare green comet, which you now know, because they say rare green comet, first time in 50,000 years, that is a long period comet with C2 in its coma. In other words, any random long period comet. Beautiful to look at, but nothing special and not particularly rare. Now, what we understand about the way these way comets work is that the gases that we see come from sublimation of ice. Could be ices of the gases that we're looking at, or it could be water or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide ice with other gases entrained within it that happens below the surface of a comet. In other words, the surface heats, heat goes down, reaches a layer of frost, the frost evaporates, and then the gases escape. And as you go deeper into the comet, you get closer and closer to the original primordial conditions, but the stuff that we're getting is up in the outer layers. And um, I include a spectrum here that kind of just shows classically what we studied for most of the last century. So here is that C2. You can see this is brightness. So you can see that C2 thing is very bright. You can see that CN thing is very bright right there. And down here, we have a super bright emission feature from hydroxyl, which is an OH, which you might figure out is something related to water. We didn't normally discover that because OH is actually produced at a wavelength where the Earth's atmosphere is starting to become opaque. So it's, you can see it from the ground, but you need a bigger telescope. Also, the human eye can't see it. It's at 
3,000 angstroms, which is about 1,000 angstroms below the best a human being can see with their eye. And I also include these little uh, colored blocks in here. These are the wavelengths of optical filters that we use to image the distribution of those gases around comets. So we can look at where is the C2, where is the CN, where is the OH. And these are pictures down here, one of CN in a comet and another just dust. Very different. So by looking at that, we can, we can uh, identify differences in how gas is produced. Um, the other thing that we can do is something called uh, spatial filtering. So we take that image and then we reduce an ideal spherical distribution. In other words, what if the gases were just expanding outward perfectly uniformly in space in all directions without any structure whatsoever? We subtract that off and we see actually the patterns by which this is produced on the surface. So these are some images by one of my graduate students from uh, uh, Comet 45P, Honda Mercos Pajasakova. And I just said that so I, I would impress you with my ability to say Honda Mercos Pajasakova. Uh, and these are images taken almost at the same time of C2, CN, and you can see they look very similar. So there's a lot of CN coming off on two sides of the nucleus. And then there's dust, and the dust is mostly coming off over here. And then there's hydroxyl, which is coming off in an entirely different direction. We see this in all comets, and we have no idea why it does this. It's very hard to figure that out. We can also spatially filter dust images, and we can actually see the rotation of a comet in the shape of the, the uh, dust coming off. You can see these concentric shells. This is from Comet hale bopp from 1997. And you, these shells are spaced by one rotation of the nucleus. It's like a garden sprinkler that's producing that. And if you look at it on ax off axis, it looks kind of like this. This is comet Hyakutake, which came very close to the Earth in 1996. It's the first comet I ever observed. Thank you very much. And uh, you can see structures like debris following it. These debris fragments were actually producing comas of their own. It's very exciting. And you see all these jets and active sectors. So this tells us a comet is not uniformly active. They're active in parts and regions. We don't have to go to the nucleus to know that. Now, the gas production rate, the amount of material coming off a comet at any given time, changes as it gets closer or moves farther away from the sun. This is kind of obvious, right? Because if you're out beyond the orbit of Mars, it's cold, so ice doesn't melt as well. You get in close inside the orbit of Earth, ice melts really well, and so the amount of gas comes off. And so you get these patterns where you start it a long way off, and then it peaks, and then it goes back off. And we see this, again, from every comet, and we can map the amount and rate it to the distance from the sun. And um, this is a very famous plot from Comet hale bopp It was the first time we really did good, uh, good work with radio frequency observations where we could look at much more complicated molecules. The key thing, two key things here is to look at water, which is steep and then suddenly picks up, and carbon monoxide, which is steep and then suddenly slows down. And this happens at about the place where water sublimation becomes easy. So we're watching the transition from CO dominating the gas that's coming off to water dominating the gas that's coming off. And what this tells us is, oh, rats. We can't really say we're looking at the entire composition because it depends on where the comet is. Because one species will dominate at one location, another species will dominate at another location. The other thing that we see in here is that a lot of these other species track with either CO or water, as opposed to evaporating like ices if they were individually there. And so this leads us to the idea that may, most of the ice in comets is carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, or water, and all of these other gases are trapped inside it. They're not individual ices. We can look at a bunch of comets and identify that they uh, have different mass ratios. So this is a little complex, but uh, the key point here is, is if this is the ratio of water to, I think, C2 and Cn. And what we find is that 
uh, there are two clusters with respect to C2. And so, and, and we take these measurements at the same location so we can get the same relative amounts of gas. And we call one group carbon depleted, we call one group uh, carbon neutral, totally arbitrary. Um, we look at this in um, other species and you can see that there are groups and there are outliers. This uh, comet Yanaka, nobody knows what's going on there. Very different from everything else. So we know that there are compositional groupings, which we expect, because some comets formed in the coldest parts of the early solar system, some form closer to Jupiter. Unfortunately, because of the way we form the Oort cloud, it's really hard to tell the difference. So, uh, so this is something that we're assembling over time. Another thing that comets do is outburst. Now, outbursts are very cool. We do not know why they happen entirely. We have a theory, a couple of theories, but what will happen is a comet will suddenly brighten. So I'm showing pictures here of comet 17P Holmes, which about 15 years ago brightened by a factor of a million in a day, and then slowly faded away. And we see this in other comets. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Why do they produce all of this uh, energy? We don't have a good answer. Now, going back to the properties of the nucleus themselves, until we flew by Comet Halley in 1986, we had never seen a comet nucleus. Uh, since then, we've seen several. I'll show you, show you them. Uh, a very small number we, can, we could see with radar. This is data that a colleague of mine took of Honda Mercos Pajasikova, said it again. And they took it with Arecibo. Unfortunately, Arecibo is gone. So you're looking at the last comet nucleus that we could see. And you can see that they're measuring its rotation in this image. Now, comet nuclei do have some interesting properties. One of the things that they do is about 10% of them completely dissipate the first time we see them. This is almost all long period comets because short period comets have already been here for a while. But they will come in and then just spontaneously disrupt and go away. Uh, so this is a very famous one, uh, 1999 S4 linear, just gone. Ison did the same. This is consistent with what we expect. Comets as strengthless bodies with no cohesion, nothing holding them together, a little bit of activity blows them apart and that's it. Another example is Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Now, many of you may remember Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. It's what got me into comets. At the time of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, I studied Jupiter. I studied Jupiter's aurora, its magnetic field, all of those things. Then Shoemaker-Levy 9 came by. It had a very close approach to Jupiter, about 40,000 kilometers away, and that was enough to break it apart. And it became this long string of objects that went around one orbit and then slammed into Jupiter very famously created all these big giant scars in the surface of Jupiter. Um, but what's very interesting about this is, one, it's very consistent with these non-cohesive objects, but also it's consistent with objects of various size. So uh, this lends itself to the idea of these objects of various sizes coming together, low velocities, probably in instabilities. Um, another comet, uh, 1995 Schwassmann Wachmann, or 73P 19, Schwassmann Wachmann, uh, actually broke apart in 2005, but didn't dissipate. The subfragments, and it's a Jupiter family comet, continue to orbit the sun. We've observed it multiple times since then, still together. I mean, the individual fragments. So that's consistent also with the uh, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 model. And we think this is consistent with this idea that these objects are rubble piles. That is, collection of individual comets put together, very much like this picture down here. So, visiting comets by spacecraft. Uh, we've visited uh, six cometary nuclei at this point, um, and one object in the cold classical Kuiper belt. That was by the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, Halley was the first. Uh, we've done some very interesting stuff with um, with some of our experiments, but you can, you can see that 
a wide variety of sizes, and a wide variety of makeup. Uh, one of the highlights was in 2005, there was a mission called Deep Impact. It went to Comet 9P Temple. It slammed a 300 kilogram copper mass into 9-3 Temple at about 19 kilometers per second, produced a giant spray of stuff that prevented us from seeing anything on the surface. But there were some pictures before that spray of stuff came out that showed self-luminous material coming out at high velocity, which is consistent with the release of as much as a thousand times as much energy as the impactor put in. We think that may have a relationship to the source of outbursts because they release huge amounts of energy compared with what's going into them. And the bell of the ball for all of this is the Rosetta mission. Uh, in 2014, ESA orbited Comet 67P churyumov garezimenko for a year and a half and discovered amazing things. It was the first time that we were actually able to measure the mass and density of a comet in precision. And it showed, indeed, very porous, 60, 70% empty space. We saw active sectors in real time. You can see them here. Active sector over here. We can see pits from which you were getting material coming out. You can see all kinds of processes on the surface of this object. And close-up pictures are really dramatic. Um, this picture here is arguably my favorite thing ever with a comet. It looks like a snowstorm. Uh, it is basically a snowstorm. It's dust grains being kicked up from the surface and falling back down on it. This is beautiful, but it's also telling us something that we have to reckon with, and that is that comets, comets are churn. Material is being released, and the surface is becoming modified as that material goes away. The other problem that we face is that all of the molecules that I described for you, I said OH, that's water, CN, that's hydrogen cyanide, C2, no idea. Uh, other species, no idea. So we're looking at the broken down fragments of molecules coming from the nucleus, not the molecules that are in ice, not the ones that are gas and trapped in ice. So it becomes a big problem. Uh, what are we looking at? The other thing that we noticed is, I showed you this before, but when we get much closer to these nuclei, they produce different gases at different locations on the surface. So from Rosetta, we saw that water is coming from here, CO2 is coming from there. We see the same thing from another comet that we visited called Hartley 2. CO is, water is coming from here, CO2 is coming off this end. That probably is telling us that we're redistributing ices on the surface or there are seasonal effects, which further complicates our ability to really go in and say what's going on. What some tantalizing things that we have seen, though, is around Hartley 2, you can't really see it all that well here, but there are chunks floating around Hartley 2, little basketball-sized pieces. And when we look down in this pit on Rosetta, on 67P, we see those same little balls. And one possibility is, is that we're looking at that fundamental pebble size out of which all comets are made. It's very tantalizing. But there are other explanations, too, so we can't really say for sure. The other thing that we have to deal with is the ones we can get to are dying. We are looking at the end of their lives. Halley has been orbiting the sun probably in its current orbit for 200,000 years, every 75 years burning off more of its outsides, churning the surface, modifying its interior. It is not the object it was. And when we compare the target of Rosetta, 67P, with the object we flew by in the Kuiper Belt, you can see those differences. You can see the evolution just grinding away that surface. How much can we trust directly applying that information to an object that's truly pristine? So we need to find something that is more pristine. Well, one possibility is to go for long period comets, because they haven't spent that much time in the inner solar system. They come by every 50,000 years. Problem is, they're moving super fast, and they're very high inclination. We're never going to orbit one of them. They're hard to predict. So we have one mission that might target one. Um, it's a European mission called Comet Interceptor. They're going to go hang out 
at a Lagrange point behind the Earth and wait for three years and cross their fingers that a long period comet will come by and they'll fly by it. I hope it works. It would be very cool, but they are hard to target. So what we really need is something more pristine that isn't a long period comet that we can actually get to and actually orbit. And that comes into the final part of my talk, which is the centaurs. I deliberately didn't mention those at the beginning when I was talking about orbital classes. So they are a fourth dynamical class. The first centaur identified in this class was in 1977. It was an object called Chiron. It's about 175 kilometers across, so big by comet standards. But we actually discovered the first one about 50 years earlier. We thought it was a regular comet. It, it is a comet, but um, the, the centaurs are the source population of the Jupiter family. In other words, you got to get from beyond the orbit of Neptune into the inner solar system. And you do that by going through the outer planets. You get perturbed by Neptune, and then the, inner, the outer planets play ping pong with you for a while, and then eventually in you go. So we know of about 300 of these centaurs. Only about 20% of them are active at all, but they're very lightly active. They've never been close enough to the sun, most of them, to evaporate water. So they are as close to pristine as any object that we can see, but they orbit prograde, relatively low inclination, we can reach them with spacecraft. Now, NASA is very interested in this. In their most recent decadal survey, they advocated for a mission to go to a centaur and land on it, called the mission Coral. Uh, and it fits in the middle of NASA's mission lines. They are a potential uh, way for us to get at this. They're hard to get to, don't get me wrong, but they are easier to get to than a long period comet. And so I'm gonna finish up talking about my favorite current object in the solar system. It's the most important object you've never heard of before. It was the first thing that was ever discovered as a centaur. It's 29P schwassmann vachmann uh, Schwassmann and Vachmann, really good at finding interesting comets because they also found the one that broke apart. Uh, but uh, it was discovered a 60 kilometer diameter object orbiting in a nearly circular orbit just beyond Neptune or Jupiter. Uh, it's low inclination and they were able to detect it because it was undergoing a major outburst in 1929. And you'd say, okay, well, how often does that happen? It happens all the time on schwassmann vachmann in fact, there are seven, on average, major outbursts per year on this object, and dozens of smaller, smaller ones. It is the only place in the solar system where outbursts happen on a regular basis, where if you went there and you orbited, you're really guaranteed to be there for one of them, which is a holy grail for us. Uh, it's also in this nice circular orbit, very close to Jupiter. We can absolutely get to that. And, um, if you look at it over here, this is a measure of activity. Chiron is this first object we discovered, much larger than uh, schwassmann vachmann one schwassmann vachmann one is an order of magnitude more active, but still it has never been close to the sun. The other interesting thing about schwassmann vachmann is that it is um, in what we have now identified as a dynamical gateway. It is a location where up to 50% of all Jupiter comet family comets go just before they make that leap. Jupiter is the arbiter, I told you, it's the big dog. Go in or go out, it's because of Jupiter. So schwassmann vachmann is the largest object in this gateway region right now. And orbital simulations, and this is a, sort of a sample a colleague of mine did, it's hard to predict these objects because even small errors in position result in a lot of chaos. But we estimate that in the next 10,000 years, there's a 70% chance that schwassmann vachmann is going to be kicked into the inner solar system, where it will become the single largest object in the Jupiter family by an order of magnitude. Certainly the largest we've ever seen. So it'll be super active, really exciting. We'll all be dead, but it's still, still, it's, it's kind of cool to see it being born right at this time. This was such an interesting thing that it provoked two mission proposals in the last 10 years at NASA, including one I led uh, that was not picked their mistake. 
So um, right now, 29P's orbit is perfectly positioned for this, but it phases every 50 years. So we are in kind of the fading part of our opportunity. We're hoping for an opportunity to try to propose to go there again in the next few years. If it doesn't happen, probably we have to wait 50 years. I hope we get the opportunity. But if it does come in, uh, it'll be spectacular in the future. And I will put up my conclusions. It's basically everything that I've talked about right here. And i um, happy to take questions. So we have time for some questions. I see there are a lot of questions. The procedure, as many of you know, is keep your hand up and wait for somebody to bring a microphone to you. I will call on you. Blue microphone. Hi, my name is Brett. I'm a member. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. Uh, just a question about uh, comets and are they losing mass? And if they are, um, does that make them difficult to predict uh, their orbit? Uh, that, that's actually an excellent question. Um, what you are talking about actually has a name. It's called a non-gravitational force, uh, which is a fancy way of saying uh, when comets lose mass, uh, it, they behave like a rocket. And so, you know, an average comet will lose something on the order of about a meter off of its radius in a passage relatively close to the sun. And that loss is going to be predominantly on the sunlit side. So you're constantly rocketing the position of a comet. And as a result, it's often hard to predict exactly where a comet will be. Even if we've seen it dozens of times, it'll go away. And then when it comes back, they'll predict kind of where it should be. And then someone has to capture it and re-establish what its orbit actually is. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm a member. Um, so I I'm interested if you can explain to me why Shoemaker Levy 9, when it fragmented, formed this long line of fragments, you know, almost almost like a train. You know, whereas one of the other comets that you showed, Hartley 2, it fragmented into little pieces, but all the pieces stayed together. And I'm just sort of wondering about uh, uh, conservation of momentum and where the sort of dispersion in velocity comes from. Uh, so the the fact that Shoemaker-Levy 9 formed a long train of objects uh, has to do with the fact that that long train is extended along the orbit. So you're actually looking at the direction in which uh, everything was going. And it has to do with the extent of the uh, tidal forces that were pulling it apart, how much residual velocity was there. We do see, for example, in uh, 73P Shuasman Wachman, we see spread out along the orbit. Um, I was showing an image fairly close to the nucleus. Uh, but you're right, it didn't spread out quite as much. Part of that has to do with the fact that uh, 73P was very close to the sun and quite active. And so you have a lot more of those non-gravitational forces. You release a lot of gases, kind of splits the objects out into uh, different areas. But they are all actually really close to the original orbit. So it's just sort of a more spread out uh, vertically, if you want to think about it from that, from that line. Whereas Shoemaker-Levy 9, we never really saw any gas production from that object. It was mostly just dust that was residual from the breakup. So it was either mostly a spent comet or it was just simply not very active at that time because it was very far from the sun. Bradley, I'm a member. So with swashman Bachman, it seems like it's such a treasure trove of data for a mission to go to. Do you know why it was not accepted, and do you know if there may be a future mission? <laughs> uh, polit politically, I'm going to uh, dif dif demur on that. Uh, NASA makes these missions, uh, puts them into four categories. Um, and category one is, we should go. Uh, they had six category one missions in the last proposal round, uh, you can go anywhere on these. So we lost to a mission to Neptune's moon Triton, two missions to Venus that were ultimately picked, uh, a mission to Io, Jupiter's moon. I thought all of those were great. Uh, I thought ours was better, but they didn't decide to emphasize it in that round. And uh, I asked that very question to NASA headquarters during our debrief, and they they gave me the same answer I just gave you. So uh, we, we hope to propose in the next round, this was in a mission class called Discovery, 
and uh, we'll, that's what we're going to do. But if we wait too much longer, it's going to be too hard. Red microphone. Hi, Matt Kaywood, member. I, I'm still a little bit confused about the formation process that you, you outlined because it just seems intuitively like there's a lot of unlikely interactions. You know, the, the, the sticking process doesn't seem very likely according to the, the, what, what you kind of showed. Is there a, a parallel we should be thinking about like with, you know, the formation of ice and snow in the atmosphere? Are there electrostatic forces that come in? I mean, is it, or is it really just stuff sticking over, over a billion years? It's, it's definitely not over a billion years. And I only gave you one theory. Uh, there is a separate theory that argues that this collection of rubble of different sizes is because comets all formed at a characteristic size of about 100 kilometers, and then they rammed into each other and shattered. And then the subunits came back together and formed a rubble pile. We don't really know how to tell the difference between those right now. Um, but if you think about it from the, from the perspective of an instability and this small collapse of a gravitational uh, uh, mass, you get rid of a lot of the shearing that happens in orbital, orbital velocity. And in fact, they come together quite, uh, quite lightly. So, uh, for example, uh, Erikos, which is the object that New Horizons flew by, that's clearly a, a binary nucleus where they slowly spiraled in together and then lightly touched. And they've been sitting there for four billion years since then. So it's a combination of various processes that can produce that. Um, but you're right. It requires very low velocities, and there is a different model for cometary interiors that implies that the velocities are high enough that the shapes are lost, and instead of having subfragments, you have kind of these layers, like bathtub rings. Uh, they call them talps, and that that there's some evidence for that at the Rosetta target 67P. But uh, as the as a colleague of mine once said. I'm not interested in what you can see from outside. Come back and see me when you can burrow in. And that's what we really need to do in order to tell. Blue microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Hamsel. I'm not a member. Um, the, uh, I, was, I was on uh, Hawaii when Yakutaki came, and, and it was all cloudy, and I was just in the lowlands. Oh, that's but a bummer. One, one night it cleared up, and it was just this massive thing across the entire sky. It was just, you know, impressive. Then later I worked on Mauna Kea, and, you know, so I hailed Bop. And, uh, was that Hail Bop? Or, or? Hail Bop yeah. was a year later, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, how did the... Uh, uh, can you can you talk? You're probably the best person to answer this. What do you think? How did the whole mechanism of creating um, Jupiter and the outer planets and the, the gas giants happen? Uh, you know, from from the comets, I guess. And is it consistent in in the universe that that the smaller rocky planets are in the interior, and the the, the gas monsters are are much further out? And uh, uh, you know, I mean, how did how was what's your your whole experience in in the evolution of Jupiter or, or Saturn? Um, well, I have to say, you know, the whole idea of forming the cores of the giant planets is maybe a little bit murky, but because ultimately you have to collide larger and larger objects together and make something bigger and bigger. We know there's plenty of large icy masses that are accumulated from small subunits like uh, Pluto or Eris or even the moons. Maybe the largest moon of Neptune, Triton, is another example of that. And those just kept slamming into each other. Now, we think our moon was formed by the impact of a Mars-sized object with a proto-Earth, and the moon is just the back ejecta from that, uh, from that impact. As far as the planets being where they are, migration is a funny thing. Uh, dissipating a cometary cloud has predictable results, but resonances might not. And so we didn't really talk much about planetary migration in the solar system until we discovered the first exoplanet, uh, which turned out to be a hot Jupiter. And a hot Jupiter orbits way inside the orbit of Mercury. It's like 2,000 degrees. And you wonder, well, how the heck did it get in there? It was from a resonance, probably with another planet that's gone. 
So the planets themselves move in and out. But the general rule is you will form an object like Jupiter more likely farther from the star because there's more mass available to make them. There's more ice and gas than there is dust. And so if the dust can accumulate ice on it, then the mass of material available to make planets is greatly increased. And so terrestrial planets tend to be small. Icy planets tend to be big. And it has to do with the availability of material. Where they end up at the conclusion of the migration and dissipation process is far more amazing than we thought 30 years ago. We continue to find planets in places we never expected. Um, and, it, and it all has to do with this interaction between them, this dance they do after they are formed together. The red microphone, and then we'll go to the blue microphone. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Harris. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I, I, just a quick question about uh, the pristine uh, comets that come out of the Oot cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are the, is the frequency of um, uh, events of, of these comets coming into our solar system? Um, I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot per year. I mean, we usually will have five to ten uh, long period comets in any given year. Uh, one thing that has really kind of changed over the last decade, and two decades really, is that we've just started to discover them much farther from the sun. And remember I said that it's gravitational tides that are pushing them in. So their perihelion distance, how close they get to the sun, is constantly getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And what we've discovered now is there's a whole class of these objects that actually are coming in and going out without ever getting inside Jupiter's orbit. And so the number of long period comets coming into the solar system is actually much larger than we realize. Uh, so it could be 10 to 20 to 30 of them per year. Uh, they don't really pose much of a risk to us because they're just coming in from random directions, but, um, but it's a surprising number. Blue microphone. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, how typical is Halley's Comet of this Halley class, and what do we know about some of the others in the class? So there are probably about... I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 objects in the Halley group. Uh, Halley is the one everybody knows. In fact, off the top of my head, I can't name another one. Uh, their orbital characteristics are very similar to long period comets, so we kind of assume that they are just long period comets that had uh, interaction with one of the giant planets and its orbit was greatly contracted. Um, as far as their properties go, they're potentially less evolved than the Jupiter family comets because the long period comets generally have fewer orbits. But we have records of uh, solid records of Halley dating back to f more than 400 BC and possibly much farther than that. And orbital dynamics suggests, like I said, 200,000 years it's been here. The interesting thing about these objects is, is that they, because their inclinations are really high, the likelihood that they'll have a big interaction with Jupiter is greatly reduced. And Jupiter is the big modifier of cometary orbits. So the Jupiter family, maybe 10,000 years, if it doesn't evaporate, before Jupiter kicks it out of the solar system. Uh, but these Halley-type comets can be here for a great long, long period of time. And in fact, there are a couple of asteroids that we think might actually be Halley-type comets that just have been here for so long, they've just stopped being active. All their outer layers are desiccated. If you have a question, keep your hand up. The red microphone is free. We'll go to the blue microphone again. Uh, Timothy Thomas, I am a member. I'm wondering about the advances in planetary evolution that we've seen with the exoplanets and so forth. What they tell us about the formation of galaxies. We look at similar kinds of processes, and I wonder if we've learned anything that will help us understand how galaxies form. Well, it's interesting. I, I came at it from the opposite end of it. <laughs> is that galaxies tell us a little bit more about how comets form. I think what it, what it kind of says is, is that you can imagine that a galaxy is maybe no different than a star, 
in the sense that if you look at a, a map of the uh, cosmic web, as they call it, is there's dense density regions, perturbations inside the Big Bang, and those perturbations are where we find galaxies. And so that means that there are density instabilities, and inside those, even on galactic scales, you can have pressure gravity mismatches, and they collapse down. Galaxies all rotate, form disks, many of them. Uh, so I think the kind of the interesting thing about it is to think about comets, planetary systems, and galaxies all as one unit. And well, obviously, the big difference is the black hole in the galaxy. And um, is that um, is the black hole formed by accretion, or is the black hole there first and the galaxy forms around it? I think they form together. I'm not a cosmologist or a galactic dynamicist, and I have colleagues who will watch this video and call me. <laughs> <laughs> One of them, in particular, will definitely call me. <laughs> so I, I don't really want to uh, go too far into it, but if I were, you know, just to, to spitball it, I would say that if you think about a giant black hole at the center like the sun, in our galaxy. It's a central condensation of mass. Lots of stars in that area, they merge together. And once you get a big black hole, big black holes try to make themselves bigger with time. An accretion view. Uh, yeah, I'm an accumulation view. Uh, we have another question. I think it's the blue microphone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lillian Salonik. I'm not a member. Um, so not too long ago, we had our first interstellar object. I think it was Oumuamua. Um, come through, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, do, those, do these objects exist on a sort of spectrum, or at what point is, does something cease to be a long period comet and uh, to be deemed to be interstellar? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, if you remember, I put up orbits. So perihelion, aphelion, parabolic orbit has an eccentricity of one, uh, a hyperbolic orbit is that its velocity is so high, it will never close. It can't. It's moving fast enough to escape the sun altogether. Oumuamua came in at very high velocity, and it went on. It's a very weird object. Its shape is very strange. Uh, it provoked people to suggest it was an alien spaceship, which would be really cool, but I don't think it is. We had that uh, talk. Did you? Avi was here, yes. Avi was here. OK, Avi well, I'm was just going to not say more. He was and, actually, uh, he was here by Zoom. So okay. you know, we're not telling where he really was, but. Maybe he was on Oumuamua. Yeah. Could, could uh, he was on an alien spaceship. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, but he suggested that. But I didn't mention this, but subsequent to Oumuamua, an actual interstellar comet entered the solar system. Uh, it has the designation of uh, 2i. Borisov, and it was probably about three or four years ago, and uh, my one of my graduate students got time on the Hubble telescope to look at the gas production from it, and we concluded, wow, it looks like a comet. <laughs> we, we were hoping for something really unusual, you know, like it, 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 gases we'd never seen before, and we're like, comet. Uh, but we should see these all the time, and we wouldn't see them if they're beyond Jupiter, because it's just very hard to detect them that far out if they're not active. We're getting better at that. And the upcoming Rubin telescope, which is going to be very big and survey the whole sky every night, maybe we'll start to see these. But the galaxy should be teeming with these objects. And so it's not a big surprise that we saw this one. But uh, Oumuamua is, uh, I'm going to suggest, probably not a comet. Maybe it's an asteroid, or maybe it's something else altogether. But Borisov, for sure, that was an interstellar comet. Okay, we have a question in the front. We'll bring the red mic up here. But uh, for now, we're going to go to Blue. Brett? Hi, Brett Magrum, member. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you had, you know, showing some models about how probably the planets migrated through the solar system. And periodically, there always seems to be the talk of Planet Nine, a large, massive object floating deep out in the solar system. And I'm curious about <laughs> whether your models take that into consideration or how would everything change if suddenly something was discovered? And do you think there is a Planet Nine lurking out there? Did you guys have Mike Brown? I think Planet Nine is Pluto. No, well, 
Um, okay, Planet Nine. Well, planet so let me let me just say this: there, there are a lot of models for how we form this. Uh, I, I could I I wrestled with which simulations to show here. There's one simulation uh, for a model that suggests that actually the solar system had five giant planets and kicked one of them out, and that was a big part of the migration process. And that's very possible. If there's a Planet Nine. It almost certainly is out there because of that process, but it wasn't kicked out fully out of the solar system, it's still orbiting, and it's very far away. Uh, the, the, the idea that it's there is based on the orbits of some of the larger trans-Neptunian objects that go very far from the sun. They appear to be clustered in an area that suggests there might be a massive body shepherding those orbits. And people have been looking. We have not seen it yet. If it's out there and that's why it's out there, uh, it's probably at least 10 times the mass of Earth. So it's probably a Neptune-sized object. If we find it, it won't really rewrite the story. It'll help us refine our models because now we know we had to put a planet out there. But it won't really change the fundamentals of what happened, but it'd be a great place to visit. And it'd just take a very long time to get there. Red microphone. Hello, um, Samantha Harris, non-member. Um, enjoyed the talk. I had um, quite a few questions that I'll save for later. But my first one, you just touched on it with the idea that when you and one of your graduate students looked at this last comet, it looked like a comet. I was struck by looking at the um, molecular species that there were only a handful of species that you would really characterize. So is that because those are the only ones that off-gas? The, is that a sampling bias? And would you expect that if you were to able to drill down on different comets that you would see different compositions? So. That one spectrum that I showed you is visible spectrum of a typical comet. And those gases are the ones we study because those are the ones that have uh, fluorescence resonances in the visible. It has a lot to do with their, uh, with their uh, or, um, uh, quantum mechanical properties that those gases have it, and some don't. So for example, you notice I did not show carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide in that band because neither of them have a resonance in the visible. We can see them in the um, infrared. We can see them in the far ultraviolet. And uh, that visible band was the first wavelength range that we could really do from the Earth. So we had ground-based telescopes to do the infrared because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs a lot of that light. You either have to get into space or you have to play games. You need bigger telescopes, different types of detectors than we had. You can do the ultraviolet. We're now adding the radio. So we're rapidly expanding the molecular characteristics of the objects that we're looking at. The importance of that grouping is that we have a century of data of those emission features specifically. And it's from that that we can get these compositional classes. And several of these comets have been looked at at the same lines, multiple orbits, over and over again. Um, the plots that I showed were from uh, my colleague who spent 40 years doing this, who they think is just down the hall from me. And uh, he, you know, he just sat on a telescope and measured it over and over and over again. And so the benefit from that is it's what we could get and what we could get a lot of. And over time, we're going to add these others to that. Do I see any more questions? Uh, somebody could get a blue microphone over there to the right side. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. In the meantime, I'm going to ask a question and display my ignorance of chemistry, despite the fact that I have a PhD in chemistry, and that is CC doesn't sound like a stable molecule. So is that just the, just the absorption band you're talking about? Or is that actually a, a molecule that's a, formed um, by photo decomposition or something like that? You are, you are correct, actually. So when I say these are fragments, okay. so um, uh, C2 is a photochemical daughter. It has parent. We don't know what that parent is. Yeah, well, no. it, it could be more than one. And that species is broken down, and about 100,000 seconds after C2 is formed, it is also broken down. Yes, yeah, OK. Uh, ultraviolet light breaks it apart. But in 100,000 seconds, it moves 100,000 kilometers, so we get a big cloud of that gas. Very interesting. But I knew it wasn't one of those normal species that we talk about down here on Earth at yeah. our temperatures. So question in the back. Uh, 
Uh, yes, blue microphone. Hugh Brooks, not a member. Um, will James Webb Telescope provide us any more insight into like the Oort Cloud or some of these other objects, or are they still too faint and for for that type of? Uh... I, I, the Oort Cloud is tough. It's really tough. James Webb is going to change what we understand about comets because the the infrared is that part of the infrared is something we don't really get to look at. And uh, a colleague of mine got a big program on there. He's taking data. It's spectacular. Um, I don't think we know yet what he's going to do to uh, change the field, but it's going to change it. But it's going to be looking at comets that get into the solar system. Uh, for an object that is, let's say, 50,000 astronomical units away, we're talking about an object maybe 100 kilometers across if it's large. It's, comets are very dark. Uh, they're black, blacker than coal. So the amount of light they reflect is maybe three, two to three percent of what shines on them. And the only, at that distance, it's likely that they're getting more light from the galaxy around than they're getting from the sun. And to detect them is probably beyond any telescope that we have or are contemplating building. Not that we couldn't eventually build one that's big enough, but I, I, I did this kind of back of the envelope once when I was trying to explain to somebody why a, a mission to the Oort Cloud doesn't make sense, is that I said if we flew the Hubble telescope to the Oort Cloud, it would probably not be able to detect any Oort Cloud objects because they're all at least 500 million kilometers apart from each other. And unless it just happened to randomly hit one, it would be very, very hard for even Hubble to do that. And that's a giant spacecraft that, you know, we put that in low Earth orbit. We're not sending that even to the moon. So uh, it's, it's really challenging. The Oort Cloud is going to be one of those things that's super tantalizing and beyond our reach, at least in the near term. And having said that, I hope to read tomorrow that we've discovered one. Uh, the, way, the way we would do it, actually, is we wouldn't try to observe it directly. We'd observe it occulting a star. And we have seen planets between stars do that. So uh, a real survey might actually detect it. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And anybody who wants to know about comics. Thank you. And before you go, uh, we have a couple of small gifts for you by way of thanking you for giving this talk, which I'll be watching again. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, the first is a signed copy of Volume 1 of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, which describes why it was founded, who founded it, when it was founded, and also has minutes of some of the early meetings in which you'll see that there was a lot of interest in astronomy, and in particular, the transit of, of Venus to calculate the size of the solar system back then. In addition, I have a framed copy of the announcement of your talk. Mm -hmm. um, signed by all the members of the General Committee on behalf of the membership. And with that, thank you so much, Walt. It's a wonderful Thanks. talk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And before you go, we have a few closing remarks. The next lecture will be on March 31st. The speaker will be Jonathan Losos, director of the Living Earth Collaborative and the Danforth Distinguished University Professor at the University of Washington. I should say, sorry, Washington University. He'll be speaking on experiments in nature to study evolution, particularly lizard island adaptations. The April 14th meeting uh, has not been arranged, so keep looking at the website to find out more. The 2477th meeting will be April 28th, and the speaker will be Amanda Padani of Cal Poly. This should be a lot of fun and a very interesting talk about life in Mesopotamian civilization a very, very long time ago, as deciphered from the incredible wealth of cuneiform tablets that have survived to this day and that record the details of everyday life in these uh, environments and civilizations. 
let's see, where are we up to? Yes, the 2478th meeting will be the annual Joseph Henry Lecture. The topic will be building habitat on the moon. Actually, I was informed today that it's going to be about space architecture in general and building things in space for human habitation, not just on the moon, but elsewhere. So there will be a speaker from Blue Origin, Daniel Innocente, and three other speakers. The 2,479th meeting will be on June 2nd. The speaker will be Sean Carroll, Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy at Johns Hopkins. And he will be speaking on a topic or topics of contemporary theoretical physics. 2,408th meeting will close out the spring lecture series on June 16th. And the speakers will be Bill Merrill and Sam Brody of Texas A&M. And they'll be speaking about the Ike Dyke Project, which is a massive infrastructure project in Houston to control flooding and storm damage. In particular, that's anticipated to get worse as uh, various changes occur in the climate. Please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings. Before you go, let's thank the people who work very hard to make all of this happen. Uh, Camille Lance, who read the minutes for us. Robin Taylor, who is always back there doing the video, the sound. Jared McQueen and Connor Nixon for running the cameras. Sam McQueen for taking care of YouTube chat, although we didn't have YouTube tonight. Uh, Brett Magarum for managing the room. Bill Mitchell hasn't done anything yet, but he will edit the video. Thank you all very much for your work. <laughs> if anybody out there feels the urge to help out with this, please see me, because we're always looking for people to run cameras, run microphones, and do some of the other things that have to be done in order to make these meetings work for everybody. With that, I will take a motion to adjourn the meeting. You have a second? Yeah, all in favor? All opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Aye.